used it. He's got fancy OBS. I'm sorry. I use poverty OBS. So. Aren't they both free? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. Poverty knowledge. Aaron, you introduce this. Um, we're going to talk about uh, DigiKey, our programming competition we had like a couple weeks ago. Um, it was remote, so we all stayed on campus, didn't have to drive anywhere, but we're going to just kind of do a, not like a here's how to solve all the problems or anything like that. It's more like a how to approach um, a programming competition, because one very different thing about this than like say the weekly competitions you guys have been doing is on our team there were four people and we had one laptop. So all of the programs had to be typed on one laptop, only one person could be typing at a time. So it changes your approach because you can't all do everything at the same time. Um, also, DigiKey has some weird types of problems that other competitions don't. Yes. So uh, like I said, it was a couple weeks ago. We had two teams. Um, just as an idea, it, I think we had to show up at like 8 a.m. and then we were done at like 4.30. So there's breaks and stuff in between and you get lunch, but it's still long. Um, and then our teams, we finished fourth and 10th. Um, and then these were our teams that we had compete. Um, so like I said, you only get one laptop. Um, since we did a remote competition, we used like Windows Remote Desktop to remote into a like system they had on site. So And traditionally, in a non-COVID uh, scenario, uh, we would be on premise at their facilities in Thief River Falls, Minnesota. 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 Um, but with the Delta variants and things, they felt more comfortable doing it remote. So that's why we remoted in. Um, traditionally, you'll be using one of their computers yep, on yep, site. Yeah, you use computers there. Um, so a thing to note, um, CADIS uses um, like standard I.O., so like printf and like, uh, now I can't remember the C equivalent of C in um, scanf. Duh. Um, uh, DigiKey uses file I.O., so that's a different. So basically, instead of pasting your code into CADIS and just being like, all right, print out this and they'll automatically handle it. We had to, uh, um, we had to, sorry, this question is trying you had to You had to read. Um, Re yeah, read it in from a file and then print out your output to, to a file and then put that file in a specific folder. And then that, uh, the judges would go into that folder and check our output sort of thing. So that's where that catch is. It's not just simple printf like they said, but like we had to actually write out to a file. So that's what that means in a more dumped down version. And then they um, provide a PDF of all of the questions, which is important because in every single step, the first thing we did is, as soon as we got the PDF, Nick would print it, I would go to the printer, and then we'd rip it apart and just hand pages to everybody so you can all work on everything more divided up. So that's actually like an important note there. All right, so the first thing we did were short programming problems, or as we call them, the easy programming problems. Um, there's 15 of them. They're basically the same thing you get like when we do our CADIS problems. They're pretty short, usually moderately simple. Doesn't take too much to think about if you can figure them out. Um, and you get an hour and 45 minutes to have as many solutions typed as you can. Um, so the way we did this is, like I alluded to earlier, we'd split up the PDF as paper to everybody, and then everybody would just read through them, pick a problem they thought they could solve, and solve it. Um, we would write, I have a folder of, full of all of our PDFs, and you just write on notebook paper some pseudocode um, for that you're solving. And then once you get your solution done, you give it to, we gave it to our team's designated typer, um, and then he'd type it up. And then if there was a bug that arose after you typed it, um, then it, we would like solve it um, that way. Like, I had one, it was bugged, I went to go look at it with him, and then we'd figure out what was wrong together. Um, so during especially these short problems, time management is super vital. Um, so in the beginning, you want to solve the easy ones, so that as you solve the ones that take a bit longer, the typer is actually typing something and not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Um, if you get one, you think it's working, but then after it's typed up, you find out it's broken, 
if you think it will take you too long to debug, you have to acknowledge that your program doesn't work and not struggle on trying to fix it. Um, this happened to us. I wrote one. It didn't work. But I realized how many points it was worth. Me and Nick had both made other solutions for easier, less point-valued problems. So I figured it wouldn't be worth the time to debug this program if we could just type up these two questions and get the same amount of points. Yeah, and, uh, and time management is a strategy that um, is important in all the competitions that you're a part of. Uh, and yeah, it's definitely like, you know, when you first hear like an hour, 30, you think, oh, it's plenty of time to get these problems knocked out. But it's very easy to get sucked into one, like when you're really trying to figure out how to solve it and stuff. So kind of having that internal clock in the back of your mind thinking like, okay, how long have I been going at this? Am I close to a solution or um, am I not yet? And then kind of being able to have that self-awareness to do that. Um, and then as Aaron mentioned, uh, this for this competition, uh, different sort programming problems had different point values. Obviously, the ones that were more difficult were more were worth more points. Um, so that was also something else that was worth consideration. Um, for the upcoming ICPC, for example, those are all worth the um, same amount of points. So that aspect um, isn't one you have to factor in. Um, but yeah, what is the key? Uh, you kind of had to factor in that point problem as well. Like if there was one that was worth more points that was easier to us to solve, then obviously you want to go after that one rather than a hard 10 point problem for us. So. And you also have to consider the time it takes to type out the solution because there was one that I had solved on paper, but it, it was very, very long. <laughs> so we could front and back. Yeah, front yeah. and back of a sheet of paper. Um, so this is just an example of a problem. This problem, I think, we also had in our programming competition, like last, like the last one we did. This was one of the problems. It was the Euler, or Euler's number. I caught myself that time. Um, where you just, it's just summing up one over the factorial of how many, like, numbers you're given. Um, so this, it's the problem. You know, it's, it looks like every other standard prompt. Um, so this is what our solution looked like. We um, notice it is on notebook paper, very kind of messy, good enough. Um, we used Python because Python is the superior programming competition language because you can do a lot of stupid stuff in it. Basically, it's, yeah, very easy and you can basically, yeah, it's a lot easier to mess with things, or yeah. So a lot um, program first things, thing but. we did, read the problem. Um, this problem, like I said, it's a loop, so for i, i is less than n, you just add one over n factorial to your sum. Um, but if you'll notice, this problem, it says somewhere in these words that it wants an error precision of 10 to 12. Uh, when we read this problem, we uh, didn't see that part. We, we skipped over it. So our precision was like 16. So we, this is important, we did not get very well on this problem. And if we actually would have read the problem in its entirety, we would have gotten placed higher. We are fairly confident. And by precision, you mean? The decimals. So instead of decimal points to 16 like we did, so like, say, you know, like 3.1459 is pi to the, f like, precision 4. So we did 16, they wanted 10 to 12. So we just misread the problem and didn't get points for it, which is something you got to deal with. All right, someone else start talking. Yeah. Okay. So, something that's at DigiKey and isn't at most other competitions is word problems, which aren't coding problems, which is why it's not at most programming competitions. <laughs> um, it's generally a mix of uh, math stuff, basic logic, and kindergarten level riddles, sometimes maybe middle school. <laughs> um, and you basically just have an hour and 25 problems. Got to solve as many as you can. Um, so we got this big old list, split it up, start at different points in the list, and then spread outwards. And then if you, and then eventually we saw all of them at least once. So we started to uh, jump around a bit and choose who should do what problem given usually what class they most recently take took that's related to it. Um, 
and then we wrote, uh, wrote down all the answers in one place. In our case, we used a big whiteboard that was in the room we were in uh, so that once it was time to submit the answers, we could go through all of them. And so we could also know who, if we had solved any given problem just by looking at anything. So here's some example problems. And these are taken from the ones that we had to solve. Uh, as you can see here, there's a hole a certain size, how many cubic yards of dirt are in the hole, extra information is given. The answer is zero because dirt isn't, there's, there's none, it's a hole. There's zero dirt in that hole. Um, the number seven is a red house is made from red bricks, a blue house is made from blue bricks, a yellow house is made from yellow bricks. What is a green house made from? Uh, is made from glass. This is a pretty common riddle. Um, sometimes they just throw those in there. The answer could have been green bricks, though. We technically don't know. They didn't give us the answers. Also, if none of you uh, were able to figure out the hole, don't feel stupid. It took uh, Nick explaining it to me to realize that. So, <laughs> When he says kindergarten level riddles, like, yes, but don't feel stupid if you didn't figure it out, because obviously I couldn't either, so uh, you aren't alone. There we go. Um, so here we have um, a different problem. Uh, this one's based on currency and coins. In the country of Strangelandia, the local currency of Strangos consists of coins in six unique denominations. Each is worth exactly five more or less, five more or five less than a different denomination, uh, but never both. So, for example, if you have one that's worth 5 and one that's worth 10, there won't be one that's worth 15 because the one that's worth 10 is already 5 more than the 5, so it can't be 5 less than the 10 also. And the sum of one value, the sum value of one coin from each denomination is 99 strangos. Uh, so we know if you take one of each, it adds up to 99. The lowest denomination is worth 6, and Tim from Strangelandia has 15 strangos in his pocket. Um, so with those last two, we can figure out that since Tim has exactly 15 strangos and the smallest amount, or the smallest denomination coin is six, we know that um, the next one up has to be eight, yeah. nine. 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 I didn't write this down. <laughs> I should have. The next one up has to be nine because um, because um, if if it's anything else, if it if it was any higher, then you couldn't get it because like if it was ten, then there's no way to get fifteen strangos because the lowest is six, and. You can't make it from 6 and 10, and you can't make it from just 6s, and it can't be lower because 6 is the lowest. Uh, then the rest of it was just going up using the 5 more or less rule, so the next one would have been 11 because that's 5 more than 6, and that makes a pair there, and then you can take the 9 and go 5 up from there, and there's that's 4 strangos there. Um, Let's see, six unique ones. So then from there, you take 99 minus the sum of what you have. Then you've got what you have left. And then you can split it up using the five off rule from there. And then the largest was worth something. Should have written it down. So uh, this was kind of one that was kind of a riddle, kind of mathy, yeah. kind of a hybrid. Um, so if x is a three-digit palindrome, and so palindrome is like, it's kind of mirrors like it's, four, two, four. Yeah, it's, this is palindrome. it's the same forwards and backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so... Um, x is three-digit palindrome, 42 more is a four-digit palindrome. Uh, so for three-digit, it just has to be the first and last digit are the same. Um, and since it's 42 more is four digits, we know it's... Uh, somewhere in the nines, um, 900 something. Um, 
because it has to be able to get up to four digits by adding 42. And so you can honestly just brute force all the nines to see what works. And when I did this one, I started at 959, which happened to work because if you add 42 to 959, that gives you 1001. And so then you just have to then format the answer into the, what is the sum of the digits of X, which is... 9 plus 5 plus 9. Which is 23. Yes. And then here's half math, half riddle, kind of, also. I add 8 to 7 and get 3. I add 4 to 10 and get 2. Both of these answers are correct. What am I? So if you do actual addition to 8 and 7, you get 15. If you do actual addition to 10 and 4, you get 14. And so something you may notice is that the difference between those two is the same as the difference between 3 and 2. Um, and is, there's, and there you gotta make for this one. There's a jump that you have to make in logic at some point, and there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. But basically, if you restrict yourself to the numbers one through twelve, um, and then loop around so that thirteen is one, or if you consider a clock where you start on a number and then go a certain amount forward. Or if you think about doing a modulo operation on the resulting number, making it mod 12, uh, you can get to the point where um, 8 plus 7 does equals 3 because 15 mod 12 is 3. It's also 3 higher than 12. Or if you start on an 8 on a clock and go 7 more, it's at the 3. So the answer is a clock. And then the last one, this one is kind of a pure math one. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole math of it. But there's a solution that is wrong here that a lot of people are probably answered. Um, and so basically, when Jill and Lucy work together, they can pick a bucket of strawberries in 20 minutes, Jill and Vanessa in 15 minutes, Vanessa and Lucy in 12 minutes. How long does it take Jill? If you just take these times and try to do algebra with it, you'll get the wrong answer because uh, it's, not, it's not additive. Like if you add on, if you take Jill and Lucy's time and you add on Vanessa's time, that won't be the same as if you take Jill and Lucy picking strawberries and then add Vanessa in because it'll actually get slower. So what you gotta do is convert these into the speeds at which they pick them and then you can just do the algebra of J plus L equals uh, 1 over 20, J plus V equals 1 over 15, etc. And then the answer was like about an hour. And so uh, after the um, short program problems and the word problems, we had what were called long problems. Um, so yes. we had four programming problems, um, and these ones were a lot more difficult to solve. Uh, we were given an hour and 15 minutes to solve um, these four, uh, and they required a lot more thought and planning. Um, so our kind of goal was, yeah, to at least get one solved within that hour 15, which on the surface kind of sounds like only one in an hour 15 with only four problems you'd think you'd be able to get more than just that one but once you start working on it you realize why the goal is one and so um, our approach like the others uh, read all the problems uh, pick the easiest one and start on that uh, like the others um, and so what we did with the long problems is we had we split like we picked the two easiest and we did two and two uh, so two worked on one two worked on the other uh, problem is uh, more difficult than the first and likely won't be solved. Um, I don't know what that's that was your guys' problem. Oh yeah, the one Nick and I worked on uh, was harder, but the one uh, that was easier, we had 
um, Aaron and then Graham over there working on it. Um, so, and that was a good strategy. Have that easiest one so you could get that programmed right away um, instead of trying to do the longer one and program that before it's too late. And to, so, to emphasize the importance of getting one solved for the long problems, I think there were just like four teams that got even one solved and one that got like one and a half solved. Yeah. Out of those four. And and, each and so in one the, is worth seventy five yeah. points, which is quite a lot considering we would have gotten third if we had gotten even two more points. Yeah. So yeah, we uh our team ended up getting fourth place and we were one point five away from getting third and so yeah. Every point counts, and so if you can just get one with 75 points, like mentioned there, uh, that was a huge jump considering the short problems were like 10, 15, 20, and the word problems were... Unknown. Unknown. We figured about three or four each for the word problems, but they didn't give us very much information about the word problems after it was done. Right. So given that scale, that's why one was sufficient enough because... 20 compared to 75 is obviously a big jump so um we did we attach a long problem in here no. okay so um we have the pdfs of all the the word problems short-term problems and long problems that we can uh share with y'all afterwards um and you can get a look at all of them yeah or resources or we'll figure out how uh we distribute that and we can post that in like this Slack channel where we we'll figure it out and we'll let you know before you guys leave where we'll where we'll put it um, but uh, the examples that we worked on we worked on uh, a parking problem that's one that we got solved I don't remember the details of that one because mm -hmm. I worked on one that was like a sock one and so basically like this dude bought socks with his friends and also bought a candy bar and you kind of have to go through process of elimination of like so this person bought this color socks and whoever bought this color socks didn't buy a Kit Kat bar, basically. Um, and so through that, you had to go through a process of elimination to figure out what this dude, I think his name was Joe or something, um, what color did Joe get? And you had to write a program that would figure out every time what color did Joe get. And so... Or um, what colors he could have gotten, theoretically. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, kind of a vague brushing over but if you take a look back at them um hopefully that's enough memory to kind of know which ones we worked on and solved and then you can go through and figure out if you can solve that one or solve one that we couldn't um let me look at it later so uh yeah last but not least we had uh the blenders um so this was kind of like a fun little uh side project that doesn't affect the scores Right. But it has its own rankings. And so uh, basically, uh, this was like kind of during the lunch hour, uh, they would do this. And so they would go through like 15 different slides, and each would have a different category. And so they'd flash a slide up um, on the screen, and there'd be six images on there. And so you had to look at those six images and kind of figure out uh, what do these images um, relate, like how do they relate to the category, and what are those things. Um, and we'll have an example here to kind of explain what it is, but kind of use those as clues to figure out which words um, are part of that answer. Um, and so you had five seconds to look at the pictures and then 20 seconds to think about those pictures and come up with your answer before the next category would come through. And so uh, the first, they, they had two of these the first time uh, we didn't have a very good strategy, and I think we got like third to last. Uh, so for the next one, we made sure to have a good strategy. So we ended up splitting up who was looking at what part of the slide, because there's not very much time to see the images. Um, so everyone only looked at a couple images, like one or two or three, two or three, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we just kind of um, tried to solve our own and then also mentioned images that we saw but didn't know what they were to see if anyone else knew them. Oh, well first let's do the example blenders. We have an example here. So 
you can just get like a text document ready if you want to try to play along here. Uh, so we're going to be showing images, six images, a category at the very top left corner of the screen. You have to figure out which of the images fit the category and then just list out the what they are. So for example, it might be uh, people from the 1970s and there might be an image of an old person and you'd have to say what their name is. <laughs> or there might be, let's see, what was a good one? There might be types of fruits. You might have a picture of a dragon, so you would put dragon fruit for that one. Or there might be a picture of a minion from Minions. So you would either put so you would put banana for that one probably. I was trying to do an example of one that wouldn't fit, but I realized it did fit. There might be a pair of glasses. You wouldn't put anything for that one. That one doesn't fit with fruits. So yeah, so the images don't exactly represent the thing. Like they could have like TV shows and have a picture of a rock, and that'd mean Flintstones. So you have to use a little bit of clever thinking with the upcoming ones. So so. Uh, be prepared. Three. Are we doing five second thing? Um, Do longer than five seconds. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's right, yeah, our first one has to break. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, three, two, one. Okay, record your answer. Ten. I wish we got that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, they're not working in teams. That's a fair point. Exactly. Yeah. Now, at this point, if this was the real DigiKey, this would probably go on for a bit longer on this <laughs> slide because the past few times they got stuck on this slide. They had like a PowerPoint where they had like automatic time trans transitions. And so that first slide, it'd go for five seconds and then yeah, you had 20 seconds to record it. It'd sit for a minute and then be like, I think it's stuck. And then they'd move it on. So uh, that's so, the inside joke that was referenced earlier. So, so anyways, next slide. And here's the last one. <laughs> I think it's like the carbon cycle. Uh, I didn't think it was, but that's my best guess. <laughs> okay. So is, is everybody if everybody has their answers down, we'll go through what the correct answers were. Here we have Fallout Boy, Kiss, and ACDC. And then in the red herrings, we have Among Us, Princess Peach, and Zank and Rank. <laughs> Types of knives, a bread knife, Bowie knife, that's David Bowie, a craft knife, and a switchblade. Uh, then we had the Wizards of Waverly Place and Fall Guys. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, then for the last one, we had Andrew Kramer, Tom Halverson, and Mike Ham. And then uh, I think this is the carbon cycle, a literal red herring, and a dog. <laughs> and that's it. So yeah, so um, these blenders, they did not count towards our score in terms of like placement or whatever but they did keep track of like the top three and then those top three got like a fancy little like we got third yeah. in the blender so we got some like fancy little coaster thing that's like a bottle opener a phone stand and lights up too so it's like a uh, five and one or something like that i don't know so some cool little coaster so it's kind of like four and one yeah it was phone stand bottle opener 
It was an approximation. And it lights up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take the time to think about it. So yeah, so for the rest of the competition, um, we got the chance to have a Q&A with one of DigiKey's uh, CIO and other staff um, and learn about DigiKey's internship opportunities. Um, you know, the reason that DigiKey wanted um, upperclassmen and, uh, you know, those interested in DigiKey is they use this um, not only as a competition, but, you know, kind of as a recruiting, recruiting purpose as well. Um, so a cool, a cool way to recruit, in my opinion, better than just showing up here and saying, hey, it's our company, but like that's good too, sort of thing. Anyway, um, so uh, so yeah, that was sprinkled in during the lunch hour. Um, we had lunch and uh, got to talk to some of those people and learn about their company. Um, and then yeah, um, other information. So, yeah, so. We, yeah. we got things. Even if you don't win, you get stuff, which is very nice. Last year, I think we got like a terabyte external hard drive. Which, and that was for everybody, which was kind of surprising. Um, yeah. But then uh, if you're very interested, make sure you sign up next year because you can only compete two years. So me and Nick have both competed two years, so we can't compete again. And then there's somebody else on the other team, I think, that has also competed for two years, so they can't compete again. Um, so a lot of open slots. Yes. So, so again, come join me. Juniors I and seniors. I got one more year, so come, yeah, go come join me. Um, so yeah, to uh, touch more on what we won this year, I did not know you won a terabyte hard drive last year. Now I'm jealous. Um, so this year we got like this big like thermal like bag freezer, bag. Like, freezer bag so you can like throw food in there. It says hot, cold, uh, t-shirt, uh, coaster, well that was for everybody, wonders. Everybody but, gets the t-shirt. Um, there were some other really good ones too that I'm yeah. blanking on bottle. now. What was that thing with the There was a Camelback water bottle. There was a hammock. We got an entire, like, big old hammock. Oh, um, oh um, that was the collapsing metal straw for the bottle. Oh. Yeah. So, so, yeah, and that's for every participant. So, their participation trophies are pretty cool. Um, and so, uh, yeah, definitely sign up next year if you are interested. We will have a bunch of open spots, and it's a really fun opportunity and competition. So we'll open the floor to questions. Um, yeah. Otherwise, um, yeah, we can post them on the resources page, probably. Yeah. So it'll probably just be a link to GitHub. Yeah. Sounds good. So on the resources page of Programming Club, we will add those PDFs for you. Um, they don't have the answers attached to them, so uh, if you want to check with us to see if we solved it and we can match with your answer, uh, feel free to message us on Slack or Discord or whatever, or talk to us at any upcoming programming club meeting. Otherwise, um, trust yourself, you probably got it. Uh, so we'll add those to the resources page for you guys to uh, check out later. I think we also got a JSON file that had all the Yeah, we got a JSON file with all the answers for the short problems and long. Oh. Maybe long so problems. We might have to reformat that a bit, but we could post that. Okay, so we do have some answers, I guess. Never yeah. mind. Yeah, we Don't just mind get me. The word problem ones. Okay, not word problem ones, but program ones. Okay. So, yeah. Other than that, so that's all we got for you. So assuming I clicked all the right buttons in Caddis, um, we have another competition this week with five more problems. Um, and then next week we're going to do C++, but the things they don't teach you in class, like vectors and all the useful stuff. So stuff that makes C++ like actually better than C. Why does Escape do that? Because it does. Um, just do FNF11. Thanks for coming, y'all. You do. Yeah. Uh, you should and, and, yeah.